It's interesting, isn't it? As town crier, you would expect that I, you know, was born and brought up in this very fine town. It's not actually true. I was born in the suburbs of London. Uh, I have lived in Dorset for about 25 years, and I've been town crier of Dorchester for, well, over 15 years. Um, but I'm passionate about this town. It is a fabulous town with a quite extraordinary story. Um, it's a small town, but with a very, very big, uh, varied and exciting story, which I would like more people to know about. So, and I think that's part of the role of, the, of a town crier, is to you know, promote their town. Why, why, you know, Dorchester, why Dorset, why not some other part? Having been born and brought up in London, I thought, well, I don't know, I'd quite like, you know, a little bit more of the rural life. And I was aware of Hampshire and the New Forest to the east. I'd been to Devon and Cornwall to the west. But there was this sort of bit in the middle called Dorset, um, about which I knew very little other than what I had been made to study when doing O-level geography, you know, because you Lulworth Cove and Chessel Beach and so on. And of course, once you come to Dorset and explore it a bit, you find it's an absolutely fabulous county. So we moved here um, and then finished up in, in Dorchester, about which I knew precious little, really. I was aware that it must have a Roman origins because of its name. Uh, I was also aware that it was associated with Thomas Hardy, but that was about all I knew. And then the longer I stayed here and the more I discovered, the more fabulous the place became. So I became a local tour guide uh, and, well, basically I thought maybe, you know, if I was a, a town crier wearing sort of historical costume, that might serve as a sort of link between yesterday and today. Um, so that's why I became town crier. So as I say, I've been town crier for over, over 15 years and I like to think I'm getting the hang of it now. But it's a fun job, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yes, you, you are representing the town, and I can think of no finer town to represent than Dorchester. Um, and in the past, I've taken part in competitions of one sort or another uh, with other town criers, and have had a, a degree of, of success. Uh, I haven't done any competitions recently, uh, but doubtless, you know, I may, I may return to that and just see if the old vocal cords are still up to, um, you know, being accounted reasonable in the eyes of judges. Absolutely, I, th I, I think the, the traditional role of the town crier, and as far as I've worked out from the story of Dorchester, the first bellman, I think he was called at the time, uh, was appointed shortly after the great fire of Dorchester in the early 17th century. And of course his job was to sort of roam around the town during the, the, the night time hours to make sure that all was well, because obviously if a fire started in a day when timber, you know, buildings were made of timber and thatch, the sooner it was identified, the sooner it might be contained. Um, the job obviously sort of extended and expanded after that, uh, and one would make public announcements and so on and so forth. Uh, today, I mean, being first with the news is the last thing I can possibly be, because individuals get the news on their mobile phones and, you know. I think the only time when I'm possibly first with the news is when there's a local election and I race out, assuming the count is in the Corn Exchange here in Dorchester, and I race out and announce, you know, the, the last three results. And I must admit that doesn't draw a massive crowd. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, you can announce the, uh, you know, that there's going to be a fair or a fate or there's a charity this or whatever it is. Um, so it still has, it's still of some value, even though we are, if anything, last with the news rather than first with the news. I, I, think, I think one should be proud of the place you live in. Now, I mean, every town has something to celebrate, uh, but when you have as much as this town has and the variety uh, that, that Dorchester has, then one should be immensely proud. Um, not arrogant, proud and honoured. And when we have visitors, you know, they should be welcomed with open arms. They're only going to be here for a day or two or a week or whatever it is. We have the privilege of living in this fabulous place, you know, 12 months a year. So we are exceedingly lucky and we should welcome those people who come to, you know, to visit and be happy to share with them something that we can enjoy all the time.
Oh, absolutely. I think it, I think it's crucial. Um, I mean, I don't think Dorchester should be living in the past, but I think it should have regard for its past and be aware of that when it plans for the future. Um, Thomas Hardy in, uh, you know, the mayor of Castlebridge talks about um, old Rome. You know, wherever you dig within the town or around the, the surrounds of the town, you come across old Rome. Um, and that's as true today uh, as it ever was. More Roman mosaics have been found in Dorchester than any other Roman town in Britain. And of course, our story goes back much further than the Romans. So that, you know, what is now Dorchester was the site of a massive henge monument dating back as, well, it's as old as Stonehenge, obviously, four and a half thousand years, the, you know, the Stone Age. And with this sort of story, not to mention uh, you know, some of the characters that appear in history, like, I don't know, Judge Jeffreys or the trial of the Toll Puddle Martyrs or whatever. What an extraordinary and fascinating story. And I think it's very important that we remember these things and that we play to those as strengths that we have inherited from the past and they should form a part of, not all of, but a part of the way we think about and where we go in the future. A town doesn't stand still, does it? I mean, the town today uh, is significantly different from the way it was 100 years ago, and 100 years ago it was different from the way it was 200 years ago. So, of course, they change and they develop, and, and you know, technology changes, demands change, and so on, and we have to change with it. All that I seek, and if I do campaign on various issues, is that in the course of changing, we don't disregard the past, and where we can make a new development, incorporate, you know, a bit of our very, very special story, then I feel strongly that it should. Um, I also feel strongly that, you know, some develops in some places are more appropriate than others. I have no problem at all with Brewery Square, for example. Uh, it's, well, I do have a problem because they don't no longer brew beer in Dorchester, which is tragic, of course. Um, but that whole development is very exciting, and I like the juxtaposition of modern architecture with you know, new uses being given to the, the, the buildings that are being conserved. Um, I'm pretty open-minded about Poundbury. The town has to grow, and if it's going to grow, why not do so in a very unique manner? And whatever people think about uh, the Prince of Wales' development at Poundbury, it is unique. Uh, and it has added another dimension and another bit of the story to that extraordinary catalogue of events that make up Dorchester. So I don't have any problems with Poundbury, um, but I like the, the fact that that's not the only kind of development or architecture that we have. And I quite like, Brewer well, I do like Brewery Square. Looking forward to the, uh, you know, to the square opening itself. I think one of the things that attracts people to Dorchester, to Dorset, to Wessex, if you like, um, is the fact you can play that game, can't you? You know, if you're having read a Hardy story, um, you wonder, well, I wonder if I can find the place he was describing, you know, in this particular chapter of this particular story. Uh, and that's a game that's been played, well, I think, you know, ever since he died in 1928. Uh, and even before, people were coming here to find the locations. And within this town, you can identify a number of places that are associated with incidents in the stories that he wrote. But of course, the great thing about Hardy is that he is not only uh, a renowned short story writer and a novelist, but he was also a poet. And his poetry, I think, is uh, perhaps not as widely appreciated or, or some people are quite surprised to discover that he wrote poetry, uh, but he wrote over a thousand poems. I mean. You know, and if you write a thousand poems, there've got to be some that are pretty cracking, and so there are. Why have I stayed in Dorchester? I think because I just keep on finding more and more about it. The story becomes more and more extraordinary, um, and I, if my job is partly to make people aware of just how rich, you know, the story of Dorchester is, then I am made aware from time to time that I have yet to succeed in convincing everybody. And of course, they're very, very good people in Dorchester. They are a town at any given moment is the people who live in it and the people who live in this town are quite singular, quite special, extremely generous uh, and well worth spending time with. Yeah, I put that together rather well, didn't I? Yeah, you know? I <laughs>